Okay, continuing with chapter 13, I'm going to talk to you about measures of dispersion. Measure of, of dispersion means how much the data is dispersed uh, around. So, um, for example, if you were swimming in, say, the Grayson Lake, you would not want to know the average depth of the water. You would want to know the, the dispersion or the range of the water. Uh, if you were or swimming in the beach area and you couldn't swim, it would do you no good to know that the average depth or the mean depth was maybe uh, six feet. Uh, uh, if you were going to swim in the beach area, you would want to know well, what is the range of the lowest spot to the highest spot so you'd know if it was going to get over your head or not. So that's kind of the difference in dispersion. It's how things are moved away from the average, from low to high, and how far they are. Uh, like in quality control is another example. If you were buying a box of cornflakes um, at Walmart or wherever, you would want to know uh, the, the, uh, the amount of range or standard deviation in uh, the weight of that box of cornflakes. So the quality control person tries to make sure that everyone is consistent, that there's a very small dispersion, that every box is almost exactly the same. So a small standard deviation is desirable in quality control. All right, so the measures of dispersion that we study is range, which means highest to lowest, like knowing the highest spot uh, to the lowest spot in the depth of the lake, for example. And the range is just subtracting the highest and lowest. What's the range of values? Standard deviation is a more specific quality control that shows you how close you are to the mean, every value, how close it is to that average mean amount. Uh, and we have a formula for that, a little more involved. Now you won't have to memorize this formula, but you do need to know how to apply it. So if you have this question on your final, uh, the formula would be given. Uh, just to back up a minute, the, the last section that we did, those were measures of central tendencies. Central tendencies averages. And so the mean, median, mode, and range are called central tendencies. Okay, so a little different type of data or a study of data for your stats. So measures of dispersion on number 65, you're asked to find both of these, the range and the standard deviation. The range is the easy one, right? You just subtract the biggest number out of the list from this and the smallest number. So the biggest number is 8, the smallest number is 0, so there's a range of 8. The standard deviation, on the other hand, is, like I said, a lot more involved. Let's talk about this formula. This formula, standard deviation, equals the square root. The square root is the last function we'll perform. We'll need to do what's in here first. All of this perform first, and then square root your final answer. So we're going to kind of hang on to that square root to the last. That um, Greek letter means you're summing something, Greek epsilon. We're going to take the sum of each value. X is each piece of data. Luckily, our problem on number 65, there's only five numbers. You know, if you had a long list of numbers, this would be really tedious. Uh, but each number that's given, subtract the mean from that. So we'll have to find that um, average mean and subtract it from each number and then square that answer and then add all those answers together. Then divide that by n minus 1. N means how many numbers are there in our list. Like our example, there's only five numbers, so it'd be 5 minus 1 or 4. Then lastly, we'll square root that. Okay, so here we go. First of all, I need to know what the mean is for uh, those five numbers. So I will need to add those together and divide by 5. Remember how we find the mean is just adding 4 plus 6 plus 0 plus 8 plus 7. Divide by how many numbers there are. There's five numbers. That comes out to be 5. So the mean or x bar is 5. Okay, so we're going to take the sum of each number minus 5, square that, add all those together, divide it by 4. So it says divide by number minus 1, so we have 5 numbers. So divide it by 4 and then square root that. All right, so here's a chart of those steps. So the 4, 6, 0, 8, 7, doesn't matter what order you put those in, you can order them if you like, but it doesn't really matter, we're just going to add our answers. So I start with number 4, 4 minus the mean is negative 1, then we square that, negative 1 squared is 1. The number 6 minus the mean 5 is 1, 1 squared is 1. 0 minus 5 is negative 5, squared is 25, all these should come out positive when squared. 8 minus 5 is 3, 3 squared is 9, 7 minus 5 is 2, 2 squared is 4. 
Okay, so every number minus its mean and then square that value. Then the, remember the, the E that means summation. So we sum all those answers together. 1 plus 1 plus 25, 9, and 4. Now I'm getting 40. So that's our sum. Then remember the formula says divide it by n minus 1. We decided that would be 4. So 40 divided by 4 is 10. And then last step, remember we say the square root to last, square root of 10. It doesn't come out exactly um, to an integer, so we do have to round it. It says to round to thousands place. So that's three places back. The next place evidently did not round up, so it's 0.162 to the nearest thousands. So this is the standard deviation of that set of data. Notice it's a pretty large standard deviation because the numbers bounce around. They're not real close together for just five numbers. They're pretty widespread. So a large standard deviation is a large spread of the data. All right, moving on. Next topic, the last topic, is the normal curve. And a normal curve, uh, we have a bell shape, kind of an upside down bell shape, I guess. Uh, and in a normal curve, we know that there is this imaginary line right down the center for the mean and that, that it halves the curve, half and half. Fifty percent of the data, if something is said to fall under a normal curve, that means half and half, right down the middle from the mean or the data. And we have this table that's in your math Excel account that you can click on. It's also in your book that shows you all the different z-scores, which z-score just means how many standard deviations are you from the mean. The mean, again, is in the middle of this bell curve. So if we said z is 1, 1 standard deviation from the mean, that means it would be over 1, a z equals 1. And on your chart, you would see that that is 34% of the data should fall within the mean and 1 standard deviation. Now, if we said the standard deviation is one below the mean, a z-score of negative one, so how many below the mean, it's symmetrical. So this should also be 34%. So it said that most things fall in the middle of a curve. The bulk of the data, or 34 and 34, which is 68% of data, falls right in the center of a normal curve. And then you have the outliers. There's a small amount over here that's above the z-score of 1 and a small amount that's below a z-score of negative 1, kind of the outliers from the stats. And that's kind of an overview of a z-score and a normal curve. But now what we're actually going to do um, for our purposes using the chart, which I know that's what you're mainly interested in, is uh, just talk about z-scores to the left of z. So all your charts are labeled with just to the left of z. For example, number 66 says determine the area to the left of a z-score given a, b, c, d. So instead of doing this negative one part, positive one part, it just says here's a z-score and it goes all the way over to the end and tells you the area of, of the table. Okay, so starting fresh on number 66, always keeping in mind that that z is zero. If we were doing an A part, z is negative 1.67. Just to give you a visual of that, that means you're below the mean. Your standard deviation was a number below the mean. So let's say it's there. I don't know exactly where, but it's somewhere below the middle. And then when you look on the chart, it tells you the area, how many, how what percent of the data should be from there all the way to the end. Now, if you did the whole curve, the whole curve represents 100% of something. So it's always given in percents on that chart. So from a z-score of one point, negative 1.67 all the way over, what percent of a normal curve should be uh, listed? So you'll need to look on your chart. I'll do that with you. Look on the provided chart and just look up negative 1.67. You have a positive and a negative part in the chart. So uh, you'll be able to uh, find that exactly. Now notice in the, in the chart, it doesn't say 1.67 down the uh, column side. It says negative 1.6. And then you have to uh, tab over to the 0.67 across the top. So it's given like this, negative 1.6. And then you have to go over, over, over until you get to the 7. Negative 1.67, negative 1.67. 
and find that spot in your chart. And that should be, so you can check your word, 0 0.0475. Okay, that's given in a decimal form. Now, if it says to change that to a percentage, you'll need to go to right, put the percent sign on. And let's see what it says to do. Write it as a decimal. Find the area to the left, leave it as a decimal. So 0 0.0475 is your answer. So I'm double check that. Yes, left just as a decimal. Uh, if there's a percent sign included, again, you do go to right, that'd be 4.75%, and see how that's such a small amount, that's reasonable. Okay, uh, let's do that again. Let's look at point 24. Again, the question is determine the area to the left. That's exactly the way your chart is listed. So look at point 24 on your chart. Remember, you'll only find the uh, point 2 part, and then you'll have to tab over for the 4. This one is positive, so make sure you're in the positive part of the chart. So 0.2, and then move over to where it says 4, so 0.24. Find that spot in your chart, and mine is shown 0.5948. So remember, 0.2 is pretty close to the zero amount, pretty close to uh, the mean. Say, say the mean is zero in the middle, 0.2. Four would just be a little bit past that. So we're doing all the way to the left of that. So it should be more than 50%, right? Because you're on this side. So from zero on over, it's 50. And we're a little even more to the uh, side of that. So that seems reasonable, 59.48%. And then a couple more examples like that. Uh, number 67 is just understanding what a z-score is. So I hope hope you're uh, getting the feel of that, that a z-score is a standard deviation, how far you are away from the mean. So if it's a positive standard deviation, you're above the mean, above the average. If it's a negative standard deviation, you're falling below the average. Okay, so on number 67, we have some scores given. And let's see what these represent. These are results on an English exam, and they've been normally distributed, so the teacher has added the scores and done the standard deviation thing, and if you ever have a teacher that's going to use a z-score to give you a grade, uh, a z-score of zero means you're, you're the average person, a z-score of one means you're above average. Sometimes they give b's to the standard deviations of one and a's to the standard deviation of two, the ones that are real far above the mean, and then so forth. So uh, positive is good if it's an English exam or a score, right? Uh, so anyway, these have been normally distributed for this English exam, and the question is which students are above the mean? So that just means the ones with positive scores. That's Al, Nan, Dan, and Ray are above the mean. Then which ones are at the mean? Has exactly the, the mean or the average score is Faye and Half. And then the last question, who's below the mean? So that's the negative ones. Bo and Lou are the ones below the mean. 